This is video podcast 51 from learningradiology.com. 30 key imaging diagnoses everyone should recognize, part two. I'm William Herring from Albert Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia. Podcast 50 and 51 expand on AMSER's diagnostic shortlist of 22 must-see images all students should recognize, developed by Kit Schaefer and Petra Lewis. AMSER is the National Alliance of Medical Student Educators in Radiology. You can learn more about any of the topics discussed in this and the previous podcast on learningradiology.com or in the textbook Learning Radiology, Recognizing the Basics. In the first part, we discuss these 15 diagnoses. In this podcast, we're going to talk about these 15. Why does this 78-year-old man have a distended abdomen? Pause your computer or MP3 player while you think about the answer. There's a soft tissue mass in the pelvis that is displacing the loops of bowel superiorly, but an hour later, a Foley catheter was inserted and the mass disappeared. What you're seeing in the first image is a dilated urinary bladder secondary to bladder outlet obstruction, urinary retention. These are a series of misplaced lines and tubes. What could be better about the placement of this nasogastric tube? The tip of the nasogastric tube is coiled back upon itself at the esophagogastric junction. In general, the tip of a nasogastric tube should lie greater than 10 centimeters from the esophagogastric junction because there is a side hole in most nasogastric tubes that's located at about 10 centimeters and you want that to be in the stomach. What's wrong with the placement of this Dobhoff tube? Well, the feeding tube is clearly not in the esophagus. It's in the right middle lobe bronchus. Following insertion of a central venous catheter, this image was obtained. The tip of the catheter is in the left internal jugular vein rather than in the superior vena cava where it is intended to be. Following the insertion of an endotracheal tube, this image was obtained. The tip of the endotracheal tube is in the right main bronchus. That's produced atelectasis of the right upper lobe, as evidenced by increased density in the right upper lobe and elevation of the minor fissure, and complete atelectasis of the left lung. What could be better about the placement of this Swan-Ganz catheter? Well, the tip of the Swan-Ganz catheter is in the right descending pulmonary artery. It's a little too far out peripherally. Ideally, the tip of the Swan-Ganz catheter should lie about two centimeters from the hilum in order to avoid the risk of occlusion of a branch vessel. Why does this 23-year-old have a cough? You can see there's increased density at the left lung base, which is obscuring the left hemidiaphragm. On the lateral view, there is something called the spine sign, in which there's increased density at the lower aspect of the thoracic spine, instead of normally would have seen on a lateral image of the chest, which is that the spine appears to become blacker. As we get closer to the hemidiaphragm, the spine appears to be whiter. Here is a composite slide that shows what lobar pneumonias look like in each of the lobes of the lung. This is a right upper lobe pneumonia. The inferior border is produced by the minor fissure. This is pneumonia in the right middle lobe. In this case, the superior border is produced by the minor fissure and the pneumonia obscures the right heart border. This is the appearance of pneumonia in the right lower lobe, which silhouettes or obscures the right hemidiaphragm. This is the appearance of pneumonia in the left upper lobe. This is the appearance of pneumonia in the lingula, which is the analog to the right middle lobe and which obscures the left heart border. 
and this is the appearance of left lower lobe pneumonia in which the heart border is retained but there is silhouetting of the left hemidiaphragm. This child was brought to the emergency department with multiple bruises. What is your diagnosis? There are healing fractures of the lateral ribs on the right side, as evidenced by the callus formation. There's also callus formation of two of the posterior ribs on the left side. Healing rib fractures, especially of the posterior ribs, is highly suggestive of child abuse. Another finding that can be seen in child abuse are small metaphyseal fracture fragments, like the ones shown in these images of the distal humerus. In this child, there is a transverse fracture of the tibia, but there is also a metaphyseal corner fracture that is characteristic of child abuse. And this is an MR of the brain in which there are bilateral epidural hematomas. Bilateral subdural or epidural hematomas are highly suspicious for child abuse. Why does this seven-year-old have respiratory distress and drooling? The epiglottis is markedly enlarged. The thumb sign is that the epiglottis should not be as large as your thumb. Normally, the epiglottis is a thin structure shown by the white arrow. The blue arrow is pointing to the epiglottic folds, which are also thin structures which connect the arytenoid cartilage with the epiglottis. Both the epiglottis and the epiglottic folds become enlarged in epiglottitis. Epiglottitis is a medical emergency and may require the insertion of a tracheostomy tube. Why does this 72-year-old have slurred speech? There is a large hemorrhage into the brainstem, which is seen on this non-contrast enhanced CT. This is an intraparenchymal hemorrhage. This is another example of an intraparenchymal hemorrhage with mass effect. The red arrow is pointing to the large intraparenchymal bleed, the yellow arrow to the midline shift from the combination of both hemorrhage and edema. The blue arrow is pointing to the shift to the opposite side of the falx. This is an example of hemorrhage with blood in the lateral ventricles. The yellow arrow is pointing to acute hemorrhage on a non-contrast enhanced CT of the brain, and the red arrow is showing where the blood has settled into the posterior aspect of the occipital horns of the lateral ventricles. This is an example of subarachnoid hemorrhage from a ruptured cerebral aneurysm. The red arrow is pointing to blood in the cisterns, the blue arrow to blood in the interhemispheric fissure. Blood in the cisterns, the fissures, and the sulci should make you think of subarachnoid hemorrhage. This is a 37-year-old who was hit in the head with a brick. Why is he feeling drowsy? Well, the yellow arrow is pointing to a crescentric area of increased attenuation on this non-contrast enhanced CT scan, which has a convexity pointing toward the brain, which is characteristic of an epidural hematoma. This person also has a large scalp hematoma to which the red arrow is pointing. In this individual, there is intracranial hemorrhage in the form of a subdural hematoma. There is a crescentric low attenuation lesion at the periphery of the brain, and it also contains, in this case, a fluid-fluid level where the heavier blood elements have settled to the dependent portion. Why does this 58-year-old have a staggering gait and incontinence? Before we answer that, let's talk a little bit about hydrocephalus, defined as dilated ventricles with abnormal cerebral spinal fluid dynamics. Hydrocephalus is divided into two major groups. There's obstructive hydrocephalus, which includes communicating, in which there's an inhibition on the resorption of the cerebral spinal fluid at the arachnoid villi, for example, from meningitis, or from normal pressure hydrocephalus. And there's non-communicating obstructive hydrocephalus, due to tumors, cysts, or other obstructing lesions. Non-obstructive hydrocephalus is the result of overproduction of CSF. This is much less common than the obstructive variety and is caused by something like a choroid plexus papilloma. 
The patient that we saw has markedly enlarged temporal horns, pointed to by the red arrow. The third ventricle is enlarged, and the fourth ventricle is enlarged, but the sulci are not enlarged. Given the patient's symptoms, this is characteristic of normal pressure hydrocephalus, a form of communicating hydrocephalus. Why does this 58-year-old have headaches? Well, you can see there are markedly dilated frontal horns of the lateral ventricles, the blue arrow, and that's being produced by a mass which is obstructing them sitting in the third ventricle. This is a colloid cyst obstructing the lateral ventricles. The yellow arrow is pointing to normal structure, the choroid plexus, in the occipital horns. This is a form of non-communicating hydrocephalus produced by the colloid cyst. This is non-obstructive hydrocephalus being produced by a choroid plexus papilloma. This is rare, and the large mass to which this red arrow is pointing represents the choroid plexus papilloma. The ventricles are markedly dilated, both the anterior and the posterior occipital horns. Why has this 63-year-old had a change in mental status? In this case, the lateral ventricles are enlarged, but there are also enlarged sulci over the convexities, and this is an example of cerebral atrophy. Cerebral atrophy, the dynamics of the CSF physiology are normal. The ventricles and sulci dilate passively. Side by side on the left is hydrocephalus, in which the ventricles are dilated, markedly so in this case, but the sulci are normal in size, and on the right, cerebral atrophy, in which both the ventricles and the sulci are dilated. What might explain this 58-year-old woman's recurrent headaches? And here's another image which I haven't shown you, which has another finding. In this case, the right breast is surgically absent, the lesion that you're looking at is a ring-enhancing lesion with marks surrounding edema. It's producing a shift of the fox due to the mass effect of the edema. And this is an example of metastatic breast carcinoma to the left parietal lobe of the brain. Two different individuals who fell injuring their neck. Why is it unwise to move either of them? First we'll look at A, and now we'll look at B. In patient A, we have to observe the three lines that connect the anterior and posterior aspects of the vertebral bodies and the spinal laminar white lines. And these three cervical lines should all be parallel to each other in a smooth curve. In the case that we've shown you, there's forward displacement of the body of C2, as shown by the red arrow, and the spinal laminar line of C2 does not align with the other vertebral bodies. This is a fracture that has occurred through the posterior elements of C2, which is called a hangman's fracture. In patient B, let's first look at the normal relationship of the superior and inferior articulating facets. Normally, the inferior articulating facet of one vertebral body lies posterior to the superior articulating facet of the body below. In our case, the inferior articulating facet of C5 has slipped forward and lies anterior to the superior articulating facet of C6, a condition here which is known as a locked facet. Locked facets are usually associated with 50% or greater anterior slip of one vertebral body on another, and they're frequently associated with spinal cord damage. There are two patients, one with pain in the ankle, the other with pain in the wrist. Why do they have pain? Well, the patient with pain in the ankle has a fracture that extends from the epiphysis through the epiphyseal plate and includes a portion of the metaphysis shown by the red arrow. This is a Salter-Harris fracture, since it is a fracture through the epiphyseal plate, and this is a Salter-Harris IV fracture. These are associated sometimes with a poorer prognosis because of angular defects that are produced when they heal. 
the patient with pain in the wrist has a diagonal fracture across the radial styloid that extends into the wrist joint. Both of these fractures are fractures that extend into joints. When that happens, the articular cartilage is frequently damaged, which can lead to earlier osteoarthritis of that particular joint. Why does this 21-year-old have elbow pain following a fall? On the lateral view, we see what's called the posterior fat pad sign in which there is this triangular lucency to which the red arrow is pointing that extends posterior to the distal humerus, indicating distension of the joint capsule by fluid in the joint. If you look carefully on the oblique view of the elbow, the green arrow is pointing to a lucency which represents a fracture of the radial head. These are two individuals, one across the top, number two across the bottom, both of whom have acute shoulder pain. Why? In patient one, the humeral head to which the red arrow is pointing lies posterior to the glenoid fossa, shown here by the yellow arrow. In this Y view, the yellow circle indicates the location of the glenoid. The humeral head, the red arrow, lies beneath the acromion process, the green arrow, and posterior to the glenoid. In the frontal view, the humeral head has the shape of a light bulb because it's fixed in internal rotation. These findings are characteristic of a posterior dislocation of the shoulder. Patient 2, the humeral head, shown by the red arrow, lies inferior to the coracoid process of the scapula, shown by the green arrow. Here we see again that the humeral head, the red arrow, lies inferior to the glenoid fossa, shown by the yellow arrow. And on this Y view, we can see that the humeral head, the red arrow, lies inferior to the coracoid, which is an anterior structure, and anterior to the glenoid, shown by the yellow ellipse. This is an example of an anterior dislocation of the shoulder. This is a 42-year-old man with knee pain after a fall. Why? Well, if we look at the image, in this case, the way it was actually taken, which is an across-the-table lateral, there is actually a fluid-fluid level in the suprapatellar bursa, which represents fat that is floating atop blood, shown by the red arrow. This is called a lipohemarthrosis and almost always indicates the presence of a fracture which allows fat from the marrow around the knee to percolate into the joint space. In this patient, the red circle is showing that there was a fracture of the proximal tibia. So we've looked at 30 key diagnoses, these 15 in podcast 50 and these 15 in podcast 51.